Um, I do want to thank Dane Arts for being the underwriter of our Dabble Wet Workshop Wednesdays. Our Workshop Wednesdays are opportunities to help artists in all disciplines um, build their business toolbox so they are more uh, ready and able to go out and grow their art business as well as spend more time doing their work because when you have a full toolbox, you can, you're able to access it and help you move forward with your business goals as well as your art goals. So that is, the, that is our plan with Workshop Wednesdays. We've been doing them uh, since, pretty much since COVID started, but we plan to do them pre-COVID. We were a little ahead of the curve there, um, but here we are and uh, willing to do these and happy to do these to the end of the year. So thanks to Dane Arts uh, for being the underwriter and sponsor of making this possible and all they do for our creative community and our creative economy. Um, so with us today, we have Mary Reinders, and she is going to lead us through Art is the Way Forward. Um, and so really looking at how art can help us lead the way and continue to lead forward. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Mary and let her take the screen. Mary, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Megan. I am happy to be here with you on a gloomy Wednesday night, um, although I promise not to sell you a gloom and doom type of presentation here. We've had quite enough of that. So this is a, a way forward. And I'm pleased to have you with me um, and thankful that you took some time tonight um, to talk about um, some opportunities within the arts. I want to tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I am a research and evaluation consultant, and I have been working in this field for the last 22 years. Um, I started off in Milwaukee, um, got a master's degree with um, an emphasis in social and sociology and social research methods. I work in the nonprofit field, um, and I do um, a lot with arts organizations as well as schools, as well as nonprofit groups. So I've I've got this perspective that I want to share um, that's particularly relevant now in kind of a time of reimagining crisis. I want to walk through some data with you, but I promise not to do it until your ears bleed. Um, it's more of a matter of figuring out how to kind of leverage some of the success that arts have had, particularly in education and community, to explore um, some opportunities for the future. Um, within this, the context of this conversation, I'm going to be talking about artists like yourselves, independent working artists, um, but I'm also going to be talking about nonprofit groups, I'm going to be talking about community, I'm going to be talking about business, um, local governments, I'm also going to be talking about the field of education, particularly um, a forum, once again, that is near and dear to my heart is uh, public education K-12. through um, we all understand the sort of symbiotic relationship between culture, institutions, and economy. Art is both the influencer as well as being influenced by uh, what's going on in the world around us. Um, we have, uh, you know, a lot of influence, particularly in the art and design world throughout our work and throughout our everyday lives. I do a lot of work with, um, for example, um, Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design, and we're constantly talking about how um, design influences every avenue of our lives uh, without us, many of us even being aware of it. I've got a little bit of a historical context. This sort of framed my thinking because I'm a big fan of FDR and New Deal um, projects and politics, particularly when it came to funding of public arts work. Um, the total investment here was $35 million, and it doesn't seem like a lot in our uh, modern age, but in that time, the, they were able to employ more than 5,000 national artists working in disciplines ranging from painting, uh, doing mural work, as well as music, literature, and storytelling. Um, there are a lot of lasting artworks and organizations that spun off of the New Deal, even though it was back in 1933, 1935. You can drive through America, particularly um, through much of the countryside and see the amazing designs, the amazing um, artworks that were developed during that time. Um, not only did um, these artworks exist or come into existence that may not have otherwise been part of the public art world, but they also gave a lot of people jobs and a lot of people skills that they were able to use 
for income. It was almost $30 a week that they were able to earn, which is a big deal at that time. But it also gave them skills that they were able to take into new work as well as a forum for gathering. Um, I read a little bit deeper about sort of the arts organizations that were developed at the time, the community centers, the civic organizations, and the organizations particularly for kids that were developed during that time, um, many of which are still in existence and considered national treasures today. So um, kind of an, an additional piece of background are the project insights that I had that kind of walk in tandem with some of that thinking around lasting arts treasures. Um, I work with United Performing Arts Foundation in Milwaukee and they have a close relationship with of course other funders like Northwestern Mutual Foundation and what they want to do is essentially with their member groups look at um, constantly look at content and delivery and partnerships and how the arts can be rich how can we work together to constantly bring more to the public but also more into institutions um, and into the public realm so we did a survey back in 2018 which was granted before the pandemic but the question was what are audiences looking for in the arts? Uh, what are they looking for in terms of content, but also delivery? And what we found out through that survey of a thousand community members is that arts tend to play an important role in their own life, in their families' lives. Whether or not they're attending the opera or if they're attending a festival, they're looking at arts as being things that they can do for family fun, education, personal enrichment, but also that sense of community. They're looking for current and relevant subject matters, a lens through which they can interpret social events, things that are going on, matters of race and ethnicity, um, historical events, um, in a fictional context or in a, in a real life everyday context. They're looking for cultural understanding. They're looking for opportunities to share and participate. They wanna pass down their love of arts to their other family members. So they're looking for multi arts opportunities. Essentially the way UPATH conceived this is an opportunity to take art out of the box. Um, with a with an emphasis on democratizing the arts because the understanding is not every family can afford a two hundred dollar opera ticket or a theater ticket the, the the recommendations that came out of this survey essentially were for member groups to look at opportunities that they can work together to create real life performing arts experiences that are out on the street whether that be festivals whether that be gallery walks uh, you know, short uh, storytelling bits, uh, theater, uh, music opportunities, opportunities for the public to learn more about what the performing, performing arts has to offer in everyday contexts. So that's one of the pieces. The other piece that I'm coming at this with is the program evaluation background that I have. A lot of the work that I've done has essentially found that arts integration is important. It's very central to learning in, in public schools. The impact is real. Um, we have studied um, arts programs over the course of the last 20 years and have found amazing social and emotional and developmental gains, uh, not only in that realm, but also in the teamwork and leadership world. Uh, we also have great partnerships that have grown up around um, the school, the public schools in Milwaukee with individual artists like yourselves as well as arts groups that have continued to pick up where public funding has really dropped the ball on a lot of arts programming within schools. Uh, the third realm, um, I sit on a lot of grant review committees, um, including the UPAF grant review committee, um, the um, Milwaukee Public Schools um, Arts and Humanities Board, as well as the Wisconsin Arts Board. Uh, we have found over time there are some commonalities in these projects that get funding and that get the most attention from reviewers. Um, we understand that professionalization obviously increases the likelihood of funding. So what does that mean? It means that you're able to effectively articulate what you're going to deliver, that you have a set of measurables um, around what you claim to um, 
the impact that you claim to have. You have good partnerships with other arts organizations or um, uh, individual artists within the communities. Um, there, there's the, the concept, once again, of multi-arts, that it's integrating things like the visual arts as well as the performing arts, as well as uh, literature art, as well as design. Um, so the more arts that can be sort of fit together um, to, to meet the um, set of outcomes that you wish to have, the better. Uh, we're also looking at, um, and this is important that I'll cover a little bit later on in detail, but a set of outcomes um, and deliverables that align with learning standards and a good understanding of the populations that are being served. So from from my perspective, what can this mean for community? Uh, we, you as artists understand what the arts can do uh, for the US economy as well as the local economy. So we're looking at $878 billion industry representing 4.5% of GDP. This means that the arts are ahead of construction. They're a, it's ahead of farming, mining, all of the major things that a lot of politicians and individuals think about when they think about big business in America. Arts is big business. Um, so the 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 arts-based economic development the development is responsible for 600,000 jobs in rural communities alone. And I want to focus a little bit later on on the rural community opportunity because I feel like that is a completely uh, not completely, but it's a, a little bit unmined. It's a little bit unexploited. Um, the NEA, the Arts Production Satellite Account, estimated Wisconsin's. Um, arts as bringing in $10.1 billion with 1,000, well, 100,000 creative workers earning $6 billion in 2020. So we know it's a big economic driver. The arts in Dane County, uh, $250 million there. And uh, we also know that artists took a pretty big hit when COVID came around. Um, the Americans for the Arts Survey reported that 62% um, of artists were unemployed, um, losing an average of $27,000 in income for creative workers. So that is nothing to sneeze at. You know this as artists. Um, it's, a little bit, it's been a little bit tough going. So what I wanted to do is explore some of the ways that arts has been leveraged um, to combat some of the COVID issues, um, some of the ways that we've gotten creative as communities to bring in uh, the arts and to, to give people jobs, to give individuals and families things to do, to increase tourism, but also to help sort of serve as a, le a lens through which we can interpret some of the major social issues that are going on. Um, so there are examples of great creative placemaking. I use that terminology from the National Endowments for the Arts. Um, there's some great um, grant opportunities and um, great resources online um, that I will link you up with later on. Uh, we've got things going on throughout Wisconsin, um, serving on the Arts Board. I've been uh, front and center looking at what's going on in Land of Lakes with partnerships and ways that artists have come together to brainstorm. Um, uh, there's a, the Great Art Center um, that's sort of serving as a community catalyst in Wausau. We've got Milwaukee and communities as small as Spring Green and, and Mineral Point getting into the, the work as well. Um, but I wanted to share with you a Mount Horeb specific case study because this is one of great opportunity. Um, I had a conversation with Rowan Childs, who is a new economic development director. She comes from the nonprofit world um, and, and serving um, the Madison Reading Project in Madison, for example. So she's got kind of an urban view uh, working within a smaller um, setting in Mount Horeb. Um, she talked about uh, wanting to um, essentially move Mount Horeb beyond the trolls and beyond the, um, the annual art fair, uh, the great stuff that goes on, but kind of looking at the future and also looking at COVID as being a stimulating factor. So she, she's brainstorming right now about ways that the arts can work with local businesses like restaurants and bars uh, to help bring in artworks to do almost the, the mural idea that could be 
um, um, images hung on doors of businesses. Uh, she's looking at festival opportunities. She's, she would like to do more outdoor opportunities for um, parents and families, teaching kids, for example, in a safe, socially distanced way, how to do photography, how to do some of these uh, great visual arts pieces, uh, painting demonstrations, sculpture demonstrations. She's looking at reinforcing um, the outdoor options also for the winter festival. Uh, that the that Mount Horeb currently holds. The way that the uh, festivals have been structured, it's sort of a one and done. It's, it's go and see this or travel around between the various galleries and go home. Uh, she's looking at it being more fulfilling, bringing in multi-arts and essentially having those events working together in an outdoor way. But something that really came up to me uh, when we were having this conversation, because I began to ask her, you know, where do you start? How do you get in touch with these artists? Where are you looking at, at, at sort of getting the ball rolling with the creative thinking? She wants to work with artists. She wants to bring in your great ideas. And she, she you know, very honestly stated that she didn't really know where to start, but she was starting with the historical society in town and the local art department within the high school. And that was about it. So what we need to do as artists is think creatively together about how we can drive more decision makers at the community level, at the leadership level, to uh, Dane Arts, to the great, um, the great uh, data set that you have going um, called Dapper. Um, you know, that's, that's a place for these decision makers to start, to look at your portfolio, to learn more about artists, and then to, to think creatively about how to bring them in for projects. Um, I've also done a fair amount of study on the other um, examples of creative placemaking and some of the factors, some of the common factors for success have been your artist creative thinking around how to return a sense of unique identity to these areas. You drive through the countryside. We drive out west every year, for example, and I see a lot of empty storefronts throughout middle America in particular. A lot of the successful art projects uh, referenced, for example, by the NEA, um, look at that local history, they look at that richness, and the art projects actually bring out um, factors that brought the individual settlers there, uh, unique stories from um, you know, the West or the families that actually develop the town. They're filling storefronts with art, empty storefronts with art. Um, they're reflecting the area's history and the unique culture. Um, but they're also doing, following some COVID safe precautions. Uh, they're doing social distancing. They're allowing for drive up view of um, some of the events um, or, you know, for example, statues being created or unique artworks, kind of like the, the, the old um, harvester um, buildings that were illuminated back in the past where people could kind of drive through the countryside and see these, these various projects. Um, the other common success factor is that they engage the broader community and artists have a seat at the decision making table. It's not just them reaching out to you, asking you for an idea or commissioning a particular work. Artists are actually sitting at the, work, at the table along with the historical society, along with economical, economic development directors and individuals from the small business community. Um, they're setting longer term strategies and goals. It's not just a one and done. You know what you want to achieve. You're uniting these various projects so that they are working toward increased tourism, for example, um, more traffic for area businesses, as well as, um, you know, opportunities for individual artists and opportunities for families and kids to learn and grow from it. Um, what I've done on this slide is provide um, some opportunities for you to follow through and look at some of the grants that are being given, announced by Wisconsin government, as well as um, in more information from the NEA about the creative placemaking. Um, I want you to consider how the arts can work with local economy on economic re recovery, uh, sort of reimagining culture, 
um, retelling history and expanding opportunities for the arts to work together. We've got some great case studies um, that we can follow up on that are also online about the connection between art and businesses. For example, Create is a great organization um, led by a very young artist in Portage County that was actually able to bring together local artists in, Portage, in Stevens Point, businesses, healthcare professionals, and innovation with 3D printers to respond to the need for PPE uh, during COVID. And that was an amazing. There's um, actually a bit on um, YouTube that I think I provided the link. If it's not in here, I'll provide it in the chat box later on. But there's just a great video that they've created about opportunities to work together to respond to some of these needs. My point is now is the time. People are slowing down. They're paying more attention to what the creative works can do for their local communities. Um, we also have an amazing um, situation in uh, Janesville as well as Oshkosh about public murals um, that are coming out there engaging a lot of artists from around the state that are reinterpreting um, culture and showing more um, examples of unity, how different artists can come together to provide that lens of interpretation, to provide those opportunities, um, attracting visitors from all over the state, once again, in a COVID safe way uh, to drive up in your car, to walk the neighborhood. And then, oh, in the meantime, um, you know, visit local bars and restaurants or stay in the community. So it's increasing um, the attraction for visitors um, to come to those areas. Um, I also want to shift gears here for a minute to talk more about education opportunities as well for um, individual artists. I work with a great organization, one of the most innovative and um, bridge building organizations I've ever worked with is Arts at Large in Milwaukee. Um, they have done a great job in connecting public schools uh, with local artists. And it doesn't matter if those local artists have a teaching background, um, they are just just great at their craft um, and they have a lot to offer. They have potentially an interest in serving in the school environment, particularly underserved schools. Um, back in 2008, I started working with a lot of um, the schools and the organizations alike. Uh, schools had been experiencing a vast under-resourcing of arts uh, programming within their schools. Uh, so that meant a lot of music teachers were laid off, a lot of visual um, artists who worked in the schools as teachers were laid off, a lot of arts programs because of budget cuts in Milwaukee were completely shut down. So essentially what Arts at Large did it, is it built itself up in 2005 as an organization that would connect um, artists from the community with the needs of the school. So what it ends, ends up doing by the year 2020 is bringing in many more and many more rich opportunities for the arts to actually serve, un, serve under school, underserved schools and kids than had ever existed before in Milwaukee. Uh, we found increased graduation rates, better student engagement at school, uh, social and emotional and skill-based growth, and particularly this great engagement uh, through active learning and through active uh, projects that kids were able to complete. Um, as of uh, 2019, they were able to seek funding to add a community center where they have been able to provide jobs and careers for kids who had gone through the program, gone through the, gone through the arts programs, as well as jobs for local artists. Um, so essentially the way they went about it is offering professional development opportunities and certification programs specifically for those um, artists. They also created an artist residency program. So even if artists were not interested in per pursuing um, art certification, they were able to serve directly with public schools. And I think it's a great opportunity for Madison to uh, learn from and potentially model. Um, in the future. There's some great connections here um, with Terry Sullivan directly at Arts at Large and then um, the person who spearheaded it through the the district side is Deb Jolitz who is the director of fine arts uh, within Milwaukee Public Schools. There are some keys to success here. It's not just a walk right into the school and uh, start serving students. Uh, there's some credentialing and training uh, which could bolster 
um, a lot of what individual working artists have to offer. Uh, you've got to make the right connections and it's not just a flyer with some of your work. Um, being able to provide your professional portfolios are key and some of your background in teaching um, or sharing your work in any format is very essential. Um, building the right partnerships and uh, an organization like Dane Arts can be that connector. Um, once again, uh, there have been some great presentations given the workshops through um, this format uh, by Walter Jankowski, for example, on networking, the importance of networking and sort of building your own professional toolkit. Um, creating your own project lesson plans. I had a great conversation with Julie Palkowski um, in preparation for this talk from DPI, uh, Depart um, Wisconsin Department of Instruction, and she talked a lot about the need for um, individual artists to create lesson plans that coincide and reinforce DPI learning standards um, that are very grade specific, age specific, but also to build those partnerships with classroom teachers so you understand where kids are, what they're learning, and how art programs and projects that you're offering can help sort of reinforce what the, the teachers are doing in the classrooms. If these programs are successful, and we found this through other evaluation projects, is that teachers can essentially adapt a lot of these creative teaching techniques and use them in their own classrooms with great success. Now, the reason I mention that is this, this is a great time because virtual learning is uh, getting kicked off in a lot of areas with varying levels of success. And I know from my own daughters online um, teach schooling programs teachers could use a lot of improv assistance and help with teaching in a creative way to help engage and to help students actually get in and learn through a virtual format because right now it's it's uh, touch and go with a lot of teachers um, I've also provided educational links and opportunities here on this page. And once again, you will have access to this um, presentation, so you can click on any of those links. I've included Peter Kuzma, who is the Director of Fine Arts uh, through um, Madison Public Schools. I've also included links to Any Given Child. And this is a great um, opportunity for individual artists to log in, to add your name to the online roster, and to provide a little bit of background about what you have to offer in terms of your own medium, as well as examples of your work. Um, it is, it was an, uh, an effort that was started. The Any Given Child project was um, spearheaded by the Overture Center, but also had collaboration from Madison Public Schools and the Foundation for Madison Public Schools. So it started off um, in March, April, and it was essentially kind of had the legs chopped off from under it uh, with the COVID um, pause. But there are sort of a starting, a root um, base of artists who are in there, and you can certainly log in and add um, your name and info. And Peter Kuzma is constantly um, sort of looking at the roster and looking at ways to sort of slot in professional artists within uh, the Madison School District. I've also provi provided um, some links here to Arts Wisconsin, uh, Porthole Wisconsin, um, as opportunities for you to kind of look in, um, continue to check on to see uh, what educational opportunities as well as community serve or the community partnership opportunities exist. The last two links are Young Audiences and um, Kennedy Center Teaching Artists. These are two credentialing programs which are highly rated by the Madison School District as well as DPI. So sort of follow Following um, their um, fast-tracked uh, certification program and credentialing program would be a great um, sort of set of initial certification to have next to your name as you're being entered into the Any Given Child uh, database. So I want to end here, um, but with the thought and common threads um, that networking is key, partnership is key, uh, gaining the right credentials and growing your tool toolbox um, is a great way to sort of reimagining what you have to offer and the opportunities ahead of you right now uh, during well, what can seem to be kind of a difficult time for a lot of organizations. I would open up, up for questions and discussion at this time.
right, in just a second, I'm going to uh, I'm going to unmute uh, folks. Um, we'll do a unmute. Um, Mark, it looks like you had a hand raised. Um, if you wanna, if you do wanna speak out loud and ask a question directly to Mary, if you could let us know in the chat box so I can um, unmute you, that would be awesome. Uh, first, I'm gonna unmute Mark Weller though, because he had a question at his hand raised. I just have to find you, Mark. So just one moment, please. I, I unmuted myself, oh, you can hear me. Then go for it, thank you. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Ain't technology grand. Oh Mary, yeah. I appreciate, I, I enjoyed uh, the presentation. Uh, it, thank you. Certainly. Um, wandered down a lot of a lot of paths that I had not uh, considered um, but let me be let me let me just take a, a jab at you a little bit here as politely as I can um, what you talked about was certainly interesting and you know I certainly can harken back to the uh, the lessons learned uh, from the Dust Bowl in the 30s and FDR and you know going out and paying artists to create art uh, that became part of the public dialogue of its day. Um, where I'm coming from is, I, A, I am an artist. It is in my heart, it is in my soul, I am a creator. Uh, B, I am a business person. I'm running a small business. So at the end of the day, I need to, to, to receive more revenue than my expenses and have enough to pay my taxes and then hopefully have net income at the end of the year. That's the goal. That's the goal. So can you address that more directly versus much of what you had to say, talked about kind of what I would prefer the peripheral of, you know, helping teachers, uh, you know, getting grants. Um, it, to me as an artist, getting a grant um, almost is a, is, a, is a yellow flag maybe even a white flag. I give up. I can't sell my stuff directly, so I've got to rely on somebody else to give me a crutch, which just isn't, it just, ooh, it just bugs me when I, when, 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 when all of that. If I'm a guy who makes couches, I want to sell couches to, a, to somebody who needs a couch and who's willing to agree with me on a fair and equitable price. So what's your best advice as to how I sell art, create revenue, pay my bills, and have money left over? Well, would I, my best advice right now during this time is to diversify um, what you have to offer. Um, so you're, you're going to be going gangbusters with your business, but at the same time, how can you expand your opportunity? And what I'm talking about is not volunteering your time, um, but creating another niche of what you have to offer as a businessman to schools, for example, as a contract employee, as somebody who, who would be paid for their time. Um, you wouldn't be serving as, a, as any type of volunteer in that world. The same thing goes for uh, working together with communities or working as a businessman in partnership with another business like a restaurant or a bar. Um, that you would be up for an opportunity, for example, selling your works inside that um, restaurant as a gallery setting or selling your work in addition to doing a public work, which you would also be reimbursed for. So it's a matter of not putting all your eggs in one basket, for example, and diversifying what you have to offer in that, in that art as a business realm. Well, that's very helpful. Yeah, good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Could be if Mark was able to unmute, so that is awesome to know. So if anybody else has a question that they want to pop up, that would be great. Um, so Mary, I'm wondering, you know, you had some really great examples of things that were happening, um, and you talked a little bit about the uh, rural communities and. Um, you know, one interesting that I've seen is the farm detour and how people are working together in that. Um, have you seen um, increase in um, revenue or like the ripple effect of how that's done through the economic piece um, happening in other communities and ways that could potentially do something here in Madison or in the Madison area? Uh, a ripple effect through like a rural example? Well, ripple effect of like, um, I guess I mean that a little bit more um, 
not just the artists making money or being able to survive through that, but how it might affect other industries within that community. Um, if it's, it's, I believe it's been a positive impact, at least from what I've seen. Um, that being one event as an example. Um, but uh, do you have, have you seen that happen over and over again where it's more, um, it's more, I'm sorry, the space has gone, uh, I'm really losing my question at this moment. I'm sorry, <laughs> um, trying to, uh, to clear it up and making it more confusing. Um, I guess my question is, do you see the ripple effect of economic benefit to other businesses and other parts of the community than just the artists that are making the art and doing the pieces and the project? I'll give you, I'll give you an example that I think is, is pretty relevant. And this, this is kind of going off in a little bit of a tangent, but there are, there were areas in Milwaukee in particular, and we see this in Chicago as well, that are experiencing severe economic downturn. So they can be neighbors that, or neighborhoods that have become isolated. You've got not only um, empty businesses, but you have um, crashed out windows. You have some, some intense economic depression. And we have seen in an, in an area um, similar to R River West or in, um, outskirts of um, some of the Wicker Park area in Chicago, where artists move in, um, they create, they begin creating in those areas, primarily because the rent is, is a little bit cheaper, but they, they work in, in sometimes collaboration or sometimes, you know, in isolation, but essentially it becomes an artist's world uh, with, with galleries starting to spring up, and then you see the coffee shops come in, and then you see allied businesses. You see um, things like um, students moving in afterwards. So you see this ripple effect um, that creates an economy of its own. Um, that has happened over and over again, not only in the River West area, but also in the Third Ward, the Walkers Point area of Milwaukee. And it's amazing. Um, my ad, for example, had an amazingly huge impact on the economy within those areas. Empty warehouses being used for gallery space, empty warehouses now becoming businesses that, that were completely bombed out, areas that were literally forgotten. So that's, that's how I see the germinating effect and the direct impact of the arts taking hold. Um, I mean, that's community building, but that's also business building. How do, how, does, how do the artists advocate for themselves to be able to continue to afford rent in those spaces and afford, um, advocate that they are vital to the community and how the community was built up on their backs for basically, how do they advocate to maintain rent to property owners that are purchasing property or it becoming um, rent prohibitive or cost prohibitive for them to leave, live there? How do they advocate for themselves to stay and be, continue to be part of that community? You know, what's interesting in River West in particular, the, the rent did go up, but there are more diverse housing situations and uh, different rent levels in Milwaukee versus Madison. Madison is a very high cost market to live in. So I think that that situation is going to be slightly different. A lot of those artists remain in those areas, either purchasing buildings or renting directly from other artists. And we also see a lot of strong arts association. The River West Arts Association, for example, has a very strong hold in that area with connections to business as well as artists and as uh, landlo landlords in particular. I know that, for example, there's, um, an old, there's a long-standing bookstore um, that is home to um, playwrights and uh, literary um, sort of figures from the area. That particular bookstore owns a number of storefronts and apartment buildings within the River West area, and it rents a lot directly to artists, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And the rent has pl stayed pretty stable. A lot of students living over there as well. And, um, and I'm just going to keep asking questions. If anybody else has questions, you just uh, unmute yourself or jump in. Um, but I want to be able to make sure we can gain as much knowledge from Mary as we have time for here today. Um, Mary, have you seen um, cooperative structures help with artists to be successful as a group 
um, using the co-op model, um, either in a storefront or within other ways. Do you know much about the co-op structure and if that's helped artists? I don't know a ton about them. I know, once again, I, I would uh, reference um, some Milwaukee examples. I know that artist co-ops have grown up out of Myad and um, there's there's a little bit of work being done to bring artists together and connect them directly with jobs and opportunities um, through through Myad and through those artists associations. But I would have to do a little bit of research to, to share models on kind of what's going on and how they operate. But I, but what I love about that co-op model though is the advocacy and the partnership development piece because it brings artists together to help them brainstorm about how their, their art can fit together to expand opportunities within community. Um, I would like to see more of that happening um, particularly in Madison. Um, I do just want to plug that the city of Madison does have funding available to help uh, co-ops start or businesses transition into the co-op model. Maybe an owner is looking to sell their business and they want to sell it to their employees and have their employees buy it as a cooperative. Um, and through the Madison Cooperative um, group and through the city of Madison, there is funds available for that. So if artists um, on this call are out there in the Facebook world or watch this later, um, if you are um, considering joining together with a number of other artists to do a cooperative of some sort and you do live and or work within the city of Madison, there are maybe some funds available to help with that technical piece. I think that's wonderful. Um, Mary, what is the what is your favorite um, art event that you've been to that you really felt really hit the mark on what you've been talking about today? Um, I would have to say that one of my all time favorite arts events, and this is an ongoing thing. This is gallery night um, in River or. Um, uh, the third ward of Milwaukee. And the reason I love it so much is I, you know, I'm really into painting. I, I love, you know, everything that's being done on the visual arts front, but you can walk right out into the street and you can see, you know, Shakespeare being performed. You can walk into a cafe and eat this amazing meal that has been prepared by culinary artists. You can go into a coffee shop that is being run by local high school art students. You can walk um, another couple of blocks and go right into my ad and visit their student design gallery. So because of that varied art experience, and it's so stimulating to actually step into that world, it's, it's, like, it's like living in a work of art. What have you seen them doing to adapt to COVID right now? Have you seen them go online or do something else? What have they done to be responsive to COVID? There's a lot that's shifting online, but th the thing I like about that is that it's actually having a draw, a much greater draw because people are becoming more intentional about exp exposure and communication about what is going on down there. It was kind of a it wasn't as, as well advertised and well communicated as it was in the past or as it, as it could have been. So I think the future will be more people within the outlying areas will know about it and will be more interested in coming into the city. Because Milwaukee has a reputation, um, particularly in people who live in the western and northern suburbs. Uh, it could be dangerous. I don't know what to expect there. I don't know somebody's going to steal my car if I go. I mean, there's a lot of preconceptions. And um, if you don't know the area that you're driving into, chances are you're not going to make the trip. So because they've had to go online and to work together, uh, they're doing a much better job of communication and exposure. Great. So, you know, that you hit on two really important things, communication um, and, you know, exposure being one thing, but you touched on this earlier about, um, you know, that these are not volunteer opportunities, that these are paid gigs, that there are ways that people are um, getting paid for their time as they're diversifying their, um, their skill sets and their offerings um, as an artist. How do you see the schools um, with struggling art funding to be able to pay for something like that um, as a contracted employee. Um, what are some tips on how to negotiate that or words that you would use to say, I'm not gonna volunteer my time. I should be paid for my time and talent. And this is what I'm offering you. So how would you recommend people go about making that ask? 
Well, I can tell you once again, um, it's a lot easier to pay for a teacher that you don't have to support with insurance, for example. They're, you're not a full-time employee. So it's easier for a school sometimes to think about a gig, you know, just a class, paying for it piecemeal and diversifying what they have to offer um, in terms of the arts without hiring full-time employees. So that's the first case I would make for that. Um, the other piece is, is that school, schools need to think about engagement opportunity. They need that creative thinking that they don't ha always have in other academic subjects. I don't wanna put down math and science, but since we've moved to an online format, um, we need to in integrate more of the arts um, to increase engagement and to overcome learning barriers that come from not being able to be eyeball to eyeball with that kid. I was working on unmuting myself, but was oh. having a hard time getting that button there. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it sounds like part of it is making the case for why you would be a beneficial person to bring into that school. Um, and then also setting your price and just telling them that this is what it would cost to have me come in, but this is what I'm going to present and bring to you and to your students and to your teachers for support and, and really just laying it out in a proposal of sorts yeah. um, as you're building that relationship. In the past, um, we, I, I had this come up in my conversation with Julie from DPI. In the past, a lot of artists have presented themselves in flyers and sort of like um, just um, an email description of what they had to offer. It needs to be much more professionalized and much more intentional so that you are presenting yourself as a reliable person who is delivering something of the quality that you're promising. Uh, you're connecting it to the learning standards, but you're also connecting with that grade level and with those teachers to ensure them that what you have to offer is simpatico with what's going on in the classroom. Um, that, that was an important message. And I, I had known that before, but talking with somebody from DPI really brought it home for me. I've worked with First Stage, I've worked with um, MISO or Milwaukee Youth Symphony Orchestra, I've worked with DanceWorks. I know how they structure their programs and it's, it's in conjunction with people from the educational world. So if the closer you can get to that, the better off you are. And so looking at the DPI website for some of those standards and those are the places that you could start to look at to see how you might fit in and how you might mix with those standards and what you might be able to offer? A hundred percent, yeah. Okay, that's really helpful to know. Sometimes it's where do you start and how do you ask the first question? Exactly. You know, um, and so that's, that's really important to know. And, and I guess the message to all the artists that are out there is you are talented, you are bringing a professional level of work to whoever you're working with. And so it is okay to ask for, to be compensated for your time. Oh, um, yes. And it's also to think volunteer. about. It should yeah. never be volunteer. <laughs> I mean, yep. I don't want to, I don't want to rip off volunteers. Volunteer until you, to your, you know, heart's desire. But this is something that enriches education so much more than what a lot of people would get a, give it credit for. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I always, I always joke that um, every developer should have an artist on their staff or at least on as a consultant and paying them for their time um, to be a consultant because a lot of times they want to do something later on and they didn't design it because it didn't look right. Um, but then all of a sudden you can't run the event or have the, um, the thing that you want um, or you're being asked to do because the environment isn't set up correctly <laughs> um, or in a creative manner that can be beneficial to um, the people that they have there even to rent the space. So um, it's very important. Um, and, and diversifying that side of going out to different places that you wouldn't normally think of such as the school district, or that could even be community centers. A lot of community centers um, work very closely with the schools and do a lot of programming with and for them. Um, so I think that's another, maybe a, a slightly softer way to start is with a community center and building those relationships, um, depending on the size of the city that you're in or the community you're in. Um, that could be another opportunity um, to reach out to those community centers. Um, 
and see how they're operating. So that's, that's really great ideas. I really love um, how you touched on some of the national sides and also then a little bit more closer to home um, and what people might be able to look at here. Yeah, I think I think the most important thing for for artists to think about is that you're bringing a new way of looking at things. You're illuminating opportunity and a different way of offering maybe education or an event or just, you know, regular business happening in the community. You're energizing that decision making process and that should never be underestimated. That's what's needed right now. Mary, I think that's the perfect thing to end on. Um, I really, really appreciate your time, everyone on this call and those out in Facebook world and those that are watching this later. We really appreciate you tuning in, building your toolbox and all the creativity and talent you bring to our, our community and beyond. Um, it's really important when we're grateful. Um, I do wanna remind everybody that we do have our next workshop Wednesday coming up on September 23rd. It's Commissions 101 with T.L. Luke. Uh, T.L. Luke has been one of our artists through Dabble in the past, and um, we're excited to have them with us to talk more about commissions and learning the ins and outs of how to make that ask um, out there in the world. So you can sign up on that. We also do have um, a feedback form, so please give us feedback, ideas for upcoming workshops or things that you just want to share with us. Um, we're always happy to learn more and continue to grow and improve. Um, and again, Mary, we're really grateful for your time and all of the experience that you shared with us. Um, check out the chat box for some links and we will be sure to follow up with a, a link to the presentation and um, anything else that we may have.